This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. It is an exciting week here on Covering the Spread because not just NFL week number one, which will break down later on, but it is September baseball time. We have got a lot of fun baseball still have to be played. We're going to break that down with Rob Friedman, Pitching Ninja, getting his thoughts on his favorite strikeout props today and also taking a look at NFL week number one numbers with our first look at this week's games. Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here to kick things off by Rob Freeman. Check him out on Twitter at Pitching Ninja. You can find him on Fox, Peacock, MLB, Ness, and wherever you're consuming baseball, Rob is probably there. And Rob, it's September, man. How you doing today? I am doing great. How are you? It's I'm fired up. I mean, how could you not be? Honestly, like we got some fun divisional races. We've got um, a lot of interesting stuff going on in terms of playoffs. We've got delightful pitchers on the mound for today. Uh, Fingers crossed on Garrett Cole. I'm not sure if the weather will let us get that game in. But, you know, overall, it's a fun slate because it's a mixture of established vets like Shane Beaver, Brandon Woodruff, guys like that, Aaron Nola, but also young rising names like Jesus Lazardo. I consider Mitch Keller at times to be one of those guys. We'll talk about him in a second, but like there, there are some like fun young names out there for today. And I feel like that has to make it extra fun for you having a kind of like a smorgasbord of fun guys to watch. I love, you know, every day it's like a box of chocolate. That's right. It's just the way it works. Like (laughs) that's one thing I love. Like, did you have, did you have Cody Clemens striking out Shohei Otani in any parlays or anything yesterday? Uh I don't have anybody striking out Shohei Otani, Rob, because that requires me to root against Shohei Otani, and my yeah, brain looking. can't handle that. So, unfortunately, I did not. Actually, fortunately for me, you know, I just, I, I, I can't do that. Like, it goes against my moral code. I am totally with you. Um, absolutely. <laughs> Although, I, I'm, I'm, I can kind of sometimes root against Shohei the hitter because sure. I'm such a Shohei the pitcher fan. So, that's uh, fair. I bifurcate him. That that I like that. Okay, I like that a lot. And also, like Shohei will strike out a bit, so that's good for your brand. You know, getting a couple whiffs in there and watching him uh, make facial expressions when he does strike out—that's also a delight. So he provides even when he's not necessarily producing as well, and that's always fun. Yeah, and I and I wish more people would appreciate that because his facial expressions are awesome. Like that ten out of ten. Yeah, absolutely. Like if you had to pick, you pick you pick in between Shohei Otani, the pitcher. The batter or the facial expressions? You got to pick one. Where are we going here? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, the facial expressions are way, like he's a meme god. Like every yeah. time he, oh, he yeah. just does something interesting and uh, he's, you can't take your eyes off the dude. No. Like even the pine tar checks last year, 10 out of 10. So yeah. uh, the ways he did and stuff. Yeah, I'm totally with you. He's never boring and a oh. uh, true delight uh, for all of us. Let's dig into this Tuesday slate here, Rob. Uh, a lot of interesting names on this slate, as I mentioned. Where are you seeing value in the strikeout prop market as of right now? Well, I really like Drew Rasmus, and I mean he's the defending AL pitcher of the month. Um, I have him. I have a three-leg parlay today, and it's like bet with pitching ninja day at Fanduel. Like it? Oh, cool. yeah. Let's go. So I'm going with Drew Rasmussen for five Ks or more. And then my nice same game parlay with the Jesus Lizard, Jesus Lizardo for six <laughs> Ks or more and Aaron Nola for nine or more Ks. Yeah. And I think that those are all really fun names. Rasmussen, they haven't always given him a ton of leash so far this year, but like when he's out he's there, good. he's effective and he's good, man. Yeah. He is really good. What's been your, like your analysis of him has been frustrating for you to watch him given that they try to keep him in check do you think it's a smart thing to kind of keep his leash a bit shorter with him how do you what do you, what's your view on the way he's been handled this year yeah i think you know you give you give a guy more and more leash as he deserves more and more leash and i think after last month um he's had so many good outings in a row and starts to look like an ace and if you have him as an ace combined with mcclanahan you know those are and then you have springs mr under the radar guy who is a uh a stud too so like yeah you know they could be dangerous 
Yeah, they, they certainly could be. And I think that the hopefully the McClanahan injury winds up being okay. But uh, Rasmussen over four and a half right now at FanDuel Sportsbook, minus 108. Lazardo, if you want to do this individually versus the the three altogether parlay, Lazardo over five and a half is plus 104. Aaron Nola's baseline strikeout prop, seven and a half with plus 106. And you know, if you want to go with the alternate number that Rob was talking about, nine plus strikeouts, that's plus 210 to get you the nice parlay do between it. those two guys. But Rob, I mean, it's Aaron Nola. Why would you ever not go for the alternate number, given what he can unleash in a game? That's that's what I say. You know, all this stuff's a crapshoot, but Nola could be good for, you know, can you see him caying 10 or more? Absolutely. You can, I've seen him caying 10 or more several <laughs> times this year. <laughs> in a, yeah, he did it in a, in a consecutively yeah. in one, one game. Um, not this year, but previously. So, like, yeah, he's he's got the absolute elitist of elite stuff. And I'm uh, just hoping for a good outing from him. And if he does, that nine seems very doable to me. It was doable last time he faced the Marlins. Ten strikeouts there, eight and a third innings, just four hits allowed, no runs. He is quite good. Now, we talked about Lizardo a bit earlier, too, where he's a guy who is, I feel like he's just been a different pitcher this year. He did start towards the end of last year as well. He showed some serious signs of life there. Do you feel like the... Like ace light, I'll, I'll put it that way. The ace light stuff he has showed this year is something that we can expect to see once we're getting him, hopefully for a full season next year too. I think like to me, the dude has ace stuff, like, yeah. you know, upper nineties fastball, just wicked, uh, a wicked change up and breaking ball. Like he's always had ace stuff though. For the last few years, everybody that's played with him says the same thing that unlimited talent. And it's just a matter. Sometimes it's confidence. Sometimes it's just, putting things together. It's being a veteran. And I think as he gains more and more experience, yeah, like that dude is an, is an ace in waiting. Yeah, I hope so, because I have him in a dynasty league, so uh, I'm rooting for him. I could use <laughs> yeah. uh, I could use this Jesus Lizardo going forward as well. So he's wanted... also, yeah, he's also a really great dude, too. So like he's got his head together. He's a guy that you would root for. So yeah, I'm rooting for you and your dynasty league because he's a, I mean, long-term he will absolutely put it together at some point. And, you know, it just depends when he's going to put together a right. full season like that. And I think this year has been encouraging in terms of, you know, developing that confidence, developing that faith that he can keep doing this over a larger sample because it's been a large sample this year. So I think that that should hopefully give him the juice in the offseason to uh, look forward to next year. That three-leg parlay from Rob is plus 1,009, plus, uh, so about 10 to 1, basically, for that one to cash with uh, Nola, nine plus strikeouts, Lazard over five and a half, and Rasmussen over four and a half, get that nice same game parlay in there as well. Now, the one I wanted to ask you about for today, Rob, is Mitch Keller. I talked about him before where he's got upside. He had 10 strikeouts last time out. His number right now at FanDuel is three and a half. The over here is minus 102. Now, we could get Mitch Keller good, Mitch Keller bad in this game. And he's facing the Mets. That's a very tough matchup, very difficult team. So what's your read on Keller in what I view to be a very difficult spot, but a spot where I do like him to go over the three and a half? I see the same thing. Like Mitch Keller is a crapshoot. He's got he's got elite stuff when he's on, and when he's off, he gets shelled. And it and you just don't know. Like it it just depends. Um, what do you have? Like 10 Ks last outing? Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, going off that, sure. That I mean that number is low to me for even mediocre Mitch Keller. If you get average right. Mitch Keller, he should be able to hit it. Um, but then again, he also, you know, you just don't know. The Mets are right. tough. Their, their lineup wears you down. Great approach by that team this year. So much fun to watch the way they attack hitters, uh, attack pitchers. And uh, it's like a pack mentality to wear them down. So I, I, it's tough, but I think that number is low. And I, you know, I, I like your pick. Is there a way you think he can become more consistent? Is there something you, you see in what he's doing that could help him get there? And it, like, if you were his pitching coach, hypothetically, what would you tell Mitch Keller to try to, to, make the bad less bad yeah that you know it's tough because sometimes it just comes to to down to confidence yeah confidence in your stuff he's added velo this year i know he worked with uh tread athletics in the off season and really built himself up and uh you know i thought that was gonna make the difference he was my breakout guy this year like i had him preseason saying keep your eye on mitch keller and there are games where i feel like that was 100 percent right right and then you know you just get you have to take a break and break the cycle when negative things happen. And that comes down to just being a, a mature mental game approach. And sometimes that's the toughest thing for a pitcher. Yeah. Like, you know, one pitch at a time. DeGrom famously, like he used to, he got shelled a couple of times. It was like, 
I keep letting this spiral. What do I do? And then he learned to take it one pitch at a time. I'm not calling Mitch Keller DeGrom, but I think Mitch Keller is a, you know, he's, he's got great stuff. And if he can yeah. stop that slide mentally, you know, he, he can do it. So I think that's really where I see it is mentally. Well, Let's hope that that mental side of thing that he showed the most recent time translates to tonight. We can get him over three and a half uh, to get that strikeout prop over. That is Rob Freeman. Check him out on Twitter at Pitching Ninja and check out all of his work across Fox, Peacock, MLB, Nesson, and of course here on the FanDuel social channels as well. Rob, have fun tonight. Enjoy watching all the delightful baseball, and we will talk to you once again next week. Awesome. Thanks for having me on again, Jim. Thank you for being here, Rob. That is, again, Rob Freeman. Check him out on Twitter at Pitching Ninja to get all of the delightful gifts, hopefully some of which are from Mitch Keller for tonight. We're going to take a first look at NFL week number one and break down some spreads that I can also look back at last week and break down what went well on the college football side of things uh, with Ed and Parker. We'll break that down in one second. But first, a reminder to make sure you are subscribed to the Covering the Spread podcast feed, wherever you get your podcasts, because this week we have our first look at NFL Week 1 today. Tomorrow in the afternoon, we'll put up our College Football Week 2 betting preview. We're going to have Drew Martin on with Ed and I uh, to break down that. On Thursday, Ryan Williams and I will talk about NFL Week 1 from a full breakdown perspective, breaking down the biggest games and our favorite bets. And Friday, J.J. Zach a recent will swing by to, to talk about player props for week number one all those available in the covering the spread podcast feed and up on the FanDuel youtube page after the fact go search for that FanDuel youtube covering the spread podcast feed to get those podcasts right as they are posted also nfl kickoff Still got some time to get those future bets in. You can do so right now in FanDuel Sportsbook with their NFL Super Win bonus. Right now, anyone who places at least a $50 Super Bowl winner bet will get $5 back for each win their team has during the regular season. There are also a ton of other futures markets available like team win totals, division winners, player props, and so much more. There's no better place to get ready for the football season than FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook and official sports betting partner of the NFL. Must be 21 players. Plus and president select states only bonus issued as non withdrawable free bets that expire seven days after receipt. Max free by $50. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 Gambler or visit fanduel.com slash RG. In Arizona, 1 800 Next Step or text Next Step to 53342. In Connecticut, 1 888 789 7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat. In Indiana, 1 800 9 with it. In Louisiana, 1-877-770-STOP. In New York, 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. In Tennessee, call the red line at 1-800-889-9789. In Wyoming, 1-800-522-4700. Or in West Virginia, visit 1-800-GAMBLER.net. So what we'll do here on Tuesdays throughout the NFL season is take a first look at that week's lines because our full preview podcast did not come out until Thursday. Numbers moved before then. I did want to give a brief rundown of what my numbers are saying about the Tuesday lines to hopefully get some stuff in early on the week. I will go through where my numbers are showing value and decide, do I want to bet that now? Am I passing entirely? Or is it a wait and see situation based on injury news on Wednesday, Thursday, and stuff like that? So basically letting you know what my numbers say and then deciding, do I agree with that enough to bet it or am I holding off? We talked about some of these in the show already, but I did want to go through what we're seeing here for week number one, because I don't want to assume you've been listening for every show so far. That would, you know, plenty of new people coming along the way. So the two spots where my numbers are showing at least two sport, two points of value from a spread perspective are on the Browns and the Cardinals, two teams missing guys in week one due to suspensions. What do you know? I am accounting for that. We talked about them both earlier on in terms of liking their money lines. And unfortunately, the money lines have moved against us. Cleveland is now plus 118, Arizona plus 166. And I think the Cleveland game is a toss up based on my numbers. Um, I think the Browns are actually 0.25 point favorites uh, over the Panthers for me. The defense here is elite. I think that they should have success against this Panthers offense line. Jacoby Brissett himself is not great. We saw that last year. Even had a, he had a super easy schedule, didn't do well in it. But his supporting cast is pretty solid. I like the infrastructure around him, like the coaching staff. I think that this one, the Browns plus 118, is more a bet on the surrounding talent than it is on him. Now, again, it's worth mentioning, I like this at plus 112, and it has moved against me. So keep in mind, people with money, skin in the game, are... Moving this the other way, that always matters. But based on my numbers 
If I look independently of that, I do think there is enough here where I will bet the Browns at plus 118 in the money line. Arizona plus 166, as far as that goes, I still think the money line is the right route despite this moving against us. Either win odds at 45%, their implied win odds are 38%, which is a big, big gap. The biggest gap by my numbers for any game in week one. But I talked about this before. My numbers are not high on the Cardinals overall. They're expecting them to be worse this year than they were last year, even when DeAndre Hopkins is back. So the the Cardinals with Hopkins value in the offensive side of things, my model, is worse than the Cardinals baseline in 2021. So that's why I'm okay biting on the money line here. I'm not that high in the Cardinals, but I'm still showing value. And I'm also not low on the Chiefs. Like I think that they're a very good team, but I think that Plus 166 is longer than it should be. So with both the Browns and the Cardinals, I am taking in the information, important information, that this number is moving the wrong way and it's moving against me. Even with that accounted for, I still think there is value in the money lines here. So the the Browns plus 118, the Cardinals plus 166, both numbers I'd be willing to bet if I didn't already have those at the at the bad numbers in my back pocket. I think if you're listening now for week one, you want to get some money lines in, I think those are the best two where you'd want to go. One number that has moved my way is the Texans. Uh, I got that at plus eight and a half. It's now plus seven and a half. So I feel good about that. Same thing with the Giants. We talked about them. Uh, plus six and a half. That's now five and a half. There is value in both money lines still. If you didn't get the spread numbers there, the spread numbers have moved enough where I'm okay uh, backing off those. But I have Houston's win odds at 32%. That's up from 25% implied. The Giants win odds are 38% for me versus 34% implied. For me personally, because I have the six and a half and eight and a half uh, getting good movement, I'm okay standing pat on those and not further investing in these two teams. It might be a lot to ask these two teams to win the, these games, but I don't hate it. I think that if you didn't get in on the spreads here, I don't mind the money lines. Texans uh, plus 295, Giants plus 198. I think there is value there. So. The underdogs, the one showing value for me in week one, that's going to be the case pretty often based on uh, tracking my numbers from last year. It did show a lot more value in underdogs than on favorites. I'm okay with that personally. So I think to me, all four of those money lines are in play. Not really seeing a lot of spreads that I like based on the current numbers. I could go with the Cardinals plus three and a half, but with the way things break down and the spread versus money line with that game, I'd rather take the money line there. Same thing with the Browns versus the Panthers at two and a half. So to me, pretty money line centric slate in week number one for me with the Cardinals, the uh, uh, the Cardinals, the Browns, Texans and Giants all, all showing value. I mean, personally, I like the Browns and the Cardinals. If you did not get in the spreads, I think the Texans and the Giants could be intriguing ways to get a lot of plus money on a money line where I actually am showing some value based on my numbers. So that's the NFL week one first look. Again, we'll go further in depth to this slate on Thursday with Ryan Williams and take a look at player props on Friday with JJ Zacharies and all here in the same feed. Before we close up shop for today, did want to go back through last week, keeping the covering the past uh, segment here again for transparency. And I guess to brag on behalf of Ed and Parker for how they did in week one across college football. Our guest here was Parker Fleming. Find him on Twitter at Stats of War. And of course, find Ed Fang on Twitter at the Power Rank can find his work at thepowerrank.com. Parker's bet last week was SMU minus 11 and a half against North Texas. And this one did move against him. It closed at eight and a half. Probably shouldn't have uh, because SMU rolled early. They poured it on the second half. They won that game 48 to 10 to get the easy cover for Parker. Ed went 2 and 0 in his picks. Uh, again, uh, on Twitter at the Power Rank. His picks were Clemson minus 21 and a half back in week zero. Uh, and then Old Dominion plus seven and a half against Virginia Tech. And Old Dominion won that game outright against Virginia Tech. It closed at six, so good movement for Ed there. Got the movement, got the the cover, got the win. It was a pretty wild game toward the end, but that was mostly about the money line versus the spread. Ed had seven and a half, so even if it had gone to overtime and you know there'd been an extra point, he still would have covered based on where it was when he bet that number. So a nice win for Ed, and that one, pretty easy victory there. The Clemson line closed at 24, obviously a bit of a struggle for them for a lot of that game. And it was a four-point game late in the third quarter. Offense is struggling, but 
with these with these situations where it's a large spread, you always want to take the full game into account. You want the largest sample size possible, and that did wind up breaking in Clemson's favor. They won forty-one to ten. So if you were watching that game, probably didn't feel the best. But overall, they still won by 31 points. An easy cover for Ed there. Nice week on the college football side of things. Again, we'll have Drew Martin on this week to break down college football week two with myself and Ed. That'll be up Wednesday. It'll be posted in the afternoon, so a bit later than usual on this show. But we'll still be up on Wednesday to get to those numbers before we get to our NFL preview on Thursday. Pretty mixed bag for me on the uh, racing side of things last week. I had Landon Norris, uh, top six and top 10 in F1, alongside Daniel Ricciardo, top 10. Lando close to the top six, finished seventh, couldn't quite eke that one out. Uh, so we did catch the top 10. That was minus 270. You expect to cash that. Other two bets, uh, Lando T6 was plus 130. Ricardo uh, T10 was plus 115. That did not hit. Ricardo qualified poorly, awful during the race, completely not competitive. Pretty big disappointment, continuing what has been a, a bad year for Ricardo for sure. So could have been a mistake on my part, but he was fast Friday, so don't feel terrible about it. As far as Lando goes, he would have needed another one of the top guys to slip. There wasn't a ton of attrition during this race, so not a great week there, uh, but not a total fa failure, at least with the Lando T10 at minus 270. On the NASCAR side of things, I personally had Eric Jones, uh, 70 to 1 ticket uh, to win at Darlington. He had him as a top Chevy, too, at 30 to 1. But neither of those were available on FanDuel, so we didn't talk about them on the show here, so no credit for those there. Did feel good about the process for the bets I met, mentioned on the show, though. I had uh, Logano top 10, minus 210. Also had him outright at 9 to 1. He finished inside the top five. He won the poll. Good closing line value there. Didn't win. Uh, finished fourth, I believe, in that race. He ran well. Didn't quite cash it, though. Martin Truex Jr. had the best car that night. Uh, I had him 11 to 1 to win and minus 150 to finish top 10. Super fast car at practice. I thought he was going to win that bet, but... His car overheated, and he had to go behind the wall. Uh, didn't finish, so didn't get that one, but I feel good about the process there. Other one was Christopher Bell, the podium. He qualified second. He was in the hunt all night. He finished fifth, so close with Logano, uh, close with Truex in the outright, close with Bell on the podium. So I feel good about the analysis, both of this and for Formula One, just not the good results that I was hoping for for this week, outside of the ones you expect to hit. So. Not the best week by any means, but uh, the process was there. Did get the personal win with Eric Jones. That felt great. Uh, pretty good way to bolster the bankroll before uh, NFL kicks in. But, you know, for the show stuff, close but no cigar across the board for both NASCAR and Formula One this past week. I'll see if I can squeeze in some NFL, some NASCAR stuff still here on the podcast. But at least for like Xfinity, uh, if, you, if we've been talking Xfinity a bit, I'll have that on Twitter. So you can find that on Twitter at Jim Sonis to get a Sydney simulation. So still have my NASCAR betting guide up on number fire. So I'm not sure if we'll have time to squeeze in NASCAR during the NFL season, but uh, you can still get that on Twitter and on number fire. If you want some more racing bets within your life during NFL season. That is all that we have here for today on covering the spread. Want to give a big thank you once again to Rob Friedman, pitching Ninja for swinging by breaking down his thoughts on the strikeout props for today. Check him out on Twitter at Pitching Ninja. Tomorrow, college football going up in the afternoon with Ed Fang and Drew Martin. NFL full preview with Ryan Williams on Thursday and uh, NFL player props with J.J. Zacharyson on Friday. This week is going to be a blast. Happy to have you all along for the ride. Make sure you get those by subscribing to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts and checking out them, the video version, on the FanDuel YouTube page. Thank you all for tuning in. Good luck to you with your bets across this MLB Tuesday. We'll talk to once talk to you once again tomorrow for college football week number two. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network.